Hello and welcome to Northley United Church's virtual worship and happy Thanksgiving. So glad you could join us for this special worship service, which proves to be a very, very special service with many collaboration or much collaboration on the part of members of the community and the choir and uh, amazing uh, work by, done by all. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for participating in our worship service this morning and for making it special. I hope you enjoy your time with us. As we begin our service, we acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and tradition of the Mississauga peoples who were here long before us in this place and our responsibility for the land on which our church resides. We shall not forget. Some announcements this morning. Last Sunday, we held our very first in-person service in a very long time. It was both comforting and a bit strange, I would say. Um, we had, I believe I was told, 18 people in attendance plus staff. Um, and it was a very special time for me to be able to be in the sanctuary with, with others. And the protocols seem to hold up pretty well. We will be reviewing everything this coming week with the reopening circle and discerning whether or not we feel comfortable going ahead and having another in-person service again in the future this fall. Um, and we will certainly let you know as soon as we have uh, decided what we feel is safe for our community. So stay tuned. I commend the news bites and our website for other information about upcoming activities and events, etc. And uh, if you don't uh, have news bites, just email our church office, office at northlyunited.ca, or you can gain access through the website to subscribe for our news bites, uh, or you could call the office. There are many options and ways to connect. And thank God for that, especially in this time. So let us continue now with our worship. Please join me in the call to worship. God of the rivers, you bring water to our communities that quenches our thirst and soaks our fields. We, we praise, praise you, O God. God. God of the land, you nourish the soil and grow life in trees and grasses and gardens. We, we praise, praise you, O God. God. God of the harvest, you bring forth bounty from the earth and share it with us. We, we praise, praise you, O God. God. God of community, you call on us to share with one another, to make room at our table, to be grateful. We, we praise, praise you, O God. God. We give thanks. We, we praise, praise you, O God. God. Let, Let us, us worship, worship together, together with joy. joy. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And, and also with, with you. you. Creator God, we come together today to praise your awesome deeds. God who answers prayer, we give our hopes, our dreams, our struggles to you. We are happy in your gracious presence. We give thanks for your goodness and mercy. You crown the year with your bounty and we are grateful. We are so grateful. Amen. is 
This morning's liturgy comes from the Seasons Fusion 2020 curriculum materials that Ann Saunders uh, shared with us in the Bible study group. So we decided that we would work with them this morning, meaning that we'll be exploring three different readings, one from the Psalms, one from Luke, and one from Deuteronomy. The one from Deut Deuteronomy will be in conversational form, kind of a way for us to reflect with a message on the readings that we've had this morning. So uh, as we hear these readings, as we hear these words, may our hearts and minds be open to hearing the wisdom that we most need to hear in this time. Amen. The psalm this morning is Psalm 65, and I'm reading from the King James Version. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou chooseth, and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in the courts, in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that are afar off upon the sea, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid of thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settest, settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy, and they also sing. This morning's scripture reading is from Luke chap chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. 
He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean, but the other nine? Where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The Spirit is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Our second story this morning is a somewhat loose adaptation of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 7 to 18. It concerns questions encountered by a person with an inquiring spirit concerning variations in the outcomes of different people's quests for a meaningful life. It is particularly concerned with the question of why his own life has been so thoroughly satisfactory when he knows full well that there are other people who have encountered nothing that even remotely approximates his experience. His spirit perceives a complete lack of fairness in the range of conditions that different people encounter in their lives. And that is a bothersome concern for both his spirit and his mind. An exploratory dialogue ensues as follows. Good morning, how are things going for you these days? They're rather good, really. I have a lot to be thankful for, even though my moods are sometimes haunted by a rather large question. On the good life side, I live in a great neighborhood. Nice housing, good access to amenities, magnificent parks with walking trails, good opportunities to observe nature, and quiet places to reflect on, as it were, life, the universe, and everything. And of course, I eat well, I have clothes to wear, and shelter in my home and lots more of the blessings of life. I am actually retired with an adequate income after a great career in work. I have a magnificent spouse, kids, grandkids, and friends and neighbors with whom to share my life. And not only that, I live in Canada. Wow, that sounds great. But I'm curious, what is the big question that's haunting you about? It is really quite simple. It involves a number of variations on a central theme. Essentially, essentially, it is just the basic question, why me? Why do I live in a great place rather than a slum? Why do I live in an excellent house rather than a tent? Why do I have good food, good clothing, good relationships, a good income, and so many other good things, while other people have to beg for them? Why are these things the case for me when the world, and yes, even Canada, involves many people who do not have anything remotely approximating my kind of existence? Why do I have such good reasons for appreciating the whole of life, the knowledge, the art, the social, economic, political, spiritual, and affirming rationale of existence when too many other people, who are in their essence the equivalent of me, have neither, none of these, or at best, very smart, sparse servings of all these things. Now, let me be clear. I will not claim that I spend my days contemplating this challenge. No, I essentially live in a manner responsive to my good fortune. And I am equally not averse to claiming that I have done my share of what is required to produce these kinds of conditions in a life such as mine. I studied hard to learn well. I worked diligently at my profession. I did my best to be a responsible family and friendly person. And I applied a reasonable focus on pursuing positive goals in my life. However, I also know that my life was embedded in conditions and contexts that made all those things much more possible for me than they have been for some other people. I had good parents and a good family to grow up in. I had teachers at schooling that encouraged me to work at the things that would make me grow. I had mentors at work who showed me how to succeed. And I had a lot of other favorable conditions for living well that I know a lot of other people do not experience. It is some degree my awareness of these accidents of my own good fortune that caused me to periodically experience a lack of comfort my awareness of the range of unacceptable inequality in the scope of human existence. 
How can I be grateful for the blessings I experience while I am also aware how too many other people can only dream but approximating my kind of conditions? Why are things so unfair to some people? Yeah, I can, I can totally understand your concerns and your discomfort in con contemplating these things. I also find myself wondering about these unequal conditions in the world and life. As a person of faith, I lament the suffering that others endure. It's sad to know that some are forced to struggle in difficult circumstances when others seem to have so much, so much opportunity, so many resources and support. I sometimes wish God would somehow level the playing field, you know? But I understand now, I think, I think I do, at this stage of my faith, that is, that the answer to why it's not equal is tremendously complex and multifaceted. What's more helpful to me is to focus on what I can do about it. As a follower of Jesus, I think God's plan for how we deal with this inequity in our very complex world is to become more humane. I tend to focus on Jesus to guide me in joining my human will to his through love and compassion. You know, the larger problems are quite beyond me. I know I can't solve them, at least not on my own. But I can cope with them in a way that's reasonable to me. I, I love that God's gift of free will, for example, creativity and imagination, allows us all to express our differences of perspective, reminding us that God's creation is infinitely complex. People will experience life and respond to that life in a variety of ways. And life will not necessarily be absent of challenge, difficulty, or pain. God didn't deliver us into a deterministic world with only good outcomes. I think we all know that. I mean, if you think about it, what would motivate us to grow in depth, understanding and wisdom, if it was always easy? Perhaps hardship, to a degree, is something we have to be thankful for. I think of Jesus' Beatitudes. And don't forget the gift of Jesus' love for us and the message of loving one another. He gave us a tremendous gift in reminding us that we should be concerned about those who are in need, to focus appropriate time and resources on improving the conditions for those with less. God's intervention then is not a snap of the finger, miraculous change, but a gradual, person by person, perhaps systemic by systemic, evolution in our human spiritual growth and maturity. I think commitment to ensuring that caring for those in need by those with abundance flows from a sense of gratitude and respect for life itself. So, you are saying that this diversity of life outcomes that flow from our gift of free will kind of inescapably involves some people experiencing less than attractive lives. And those outcomes are effectively a necessary cost of the delightful variety that we should be thankful for in lives like my own. But, and I think this seems to be your key point, you necessarily add that these conditions have consequences for how we live in our own variety of possibilities and benefits. And the primary one of those consequences is that in our gratitude for what God has given to us, we should ensure that we take on the task of trying to systematically improve the lives of those in need until such time as conditions of only acceptable inequality are achieved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it goes even deeper than that. I think that when we accept the precious gift of life itself, of God's amazing creation, God's limitless, selfless love and generosity. Our hearts are filled with gratitude. 
We cannot not be grateful. And that gratitude, well, it leads to generosity. I think spiritual abundance, no matter what conditions we're in, leads us to act on our concerns for the well-being of all in the best ways we can. So, perhaps we should thank God for the blessings and for the challenges. Thank God for a community where we can explore more about God through conversations like this. And thank God for Jesus, who joins us there to bring hope and inspiration by his grace. You know what I'd like to say to that? Mm -hmm. So be it. Amen. Prayers of the People Living God, we come before you grateful for the many give, gifts that you have given this community and to each one of us. We fed on your word today and recognize that our gratitude does not end with saying thanks to you. You call on us to respond to your generosity by reflecting a generous spirit in our relationship with others and in our work with the wider community. 
May we respond to your many gifts in a way that reflects your light in the world. May others be nurtured and comforted by that light. Together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us away from temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On this Thanksgiving weekend, we are called to participate in bringing about God's abundance for all. This is a calling to be part of a world where all are respected, appreciated, cared for, where relationships are reconciled, healed, just, and loving. Yes, even now, in the midst of a global pandemic, we're called, perhaps especially now, while we're living socially distanced lives, feeling restricted and anxious, needing to protect members of our families and communities as well as ourselves. Even now we can respond to God's call. We can enthusiastically recognize moments when our lives are touched by God's love, perhaps through another person, an event, or an aspect of nature. We can generously express with words and actions our gratitude, our thank you, when we see God's love revealed. This might be when we experience our surroundings kept safe, essential services provided, a bird singing in a tree, a pet snuggling close, a restored or new relationship. This might be when we learn about crops grown, harvested and brought to our stores, food and meals donated, vulnerable people cared for, injustices exposed, the environment protected. God is still with us. The Spirit still moves among us. We are still called. Let us respond enthusiastically and generously with actions of gratitude and words of thank you. Amen. Oh.